one of my earliest memories was flying a J3 Cub with my dad, and he was letting me fly the whole flight. I was five years old, and my dad said, okay, let me fly it now. And so I got off the stick momentarily, and then I was bummed because I still wanted to fly it some more. So I was determined, I'm going to fly it some more. So in the flare, I get back on the control stick, and <laughs> I got my butt thoroughly chewed. When somebody else is flying, you don't ever touch those controls. And so that's why it's been such a vivid memory. It is just a real pleasure and an honor to have you on board today. And I, I'm sure a lot of people know all about your music career. Uh, I'll bet I'll bet they don't really know about the other side of you, the other side of your career, the other side of your life, the the aviation side of it. Uh, right. You 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 have been involved in aviation for a great many years. You and your family, I believe, right? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, my dad and his two twin brothers kind of kicked it off. Uh, they were in Alaska when it was still a territory flying the bush. Uh, after that, for I guess five or six years, uh, dad got the jet call and uh, went down to Bainbridge, Georgia and started uh, instructing uh, Air Force cadets and uh, in T-28s, T-37s, and T-6s. And uh, then along came old A.A. Ron. And, uh, you know, from the first time I put my hands on the controls of a DC-3 at four years old, my dad was a captain on DC-3. And as soon as I did that, I knew for the rest of my life what I wanted to do for a living. When I looked out the window and the cars were the size of matchbox cars going underneath me, I was stunned and taken completely. And, uh, you know, as I've said before, is when Dad said airport, I grabbed a hold of his britches leg and I would not let go. This music thing just came out of nowhere. Uh, the energy crunch of the late 70s is kind of what kicked me out of the aviation business because like you, I, well, I wanted to be asked not to start with, but it looked like that wasn't going to work out. And, and so I wanted to go to the airlines with the career I had. But that big energy crunch kind of, it was a major furlough back in those days, and I just saw I wasn't going to make it. So I turned to music. My daddy didn't like trouble. Everyone knew him, we decided to keep me home. He never was a hero, down and shining light. It's a good old night to stand, but he don't want to lie. He'd say, you've got to stand for something, or you'll fall for anything. You've got to be your own. Like the pine trees lining the winding road, I've got a name, I've got a name. Like the singing bird and the croaking toad, I've got a name, I've got a name. A lot of people uh, probably think that test flying is, and a test pilot is kind of a glamorous job. The old cliche about uh, hours and hours of boredom and moments of terror are uh, uh, truly um, applied to test flying. Uh, 
link coupling experiments. Uh, the genesis of that program was a concept developed by one of the uh, German engineers, the German scientists that came back to the United States after World War II. And he had this idea that if you took a basic airplane, you got a basic airplane, and if somehow or other you could put a floating panel, uh, just an extension of the wing, that if you could do that, you could extend the range of that airplane very cheaply. During the first test on the 19th of August, 1949, Major C.E. Anderson, Flight Test Division pilot of the Q-14, experienced difficulty in controlling his airplane after the coupling was made. A strong rolling motion to the right occurred, and before control could be obtained, the coupling inadvertently released. On July 21, 1950, the first B-29 bomber to be equipped with the new floating wingtip mechanisms took off the runway for a coupling test with an F-84 fighter. On this date, Major C.E. Anderson of Air Materiel Command's Flight Test Division made the first successful coupling to the wingtip of the B-29. On July 30, 1950, Captain J.M. Davis, also of the Flight Test Division, successfully coupled to the left wing of the B-29. During this flight, Captain Davis experienced a partial loss of aileron boost, but still was able to effect two couplings with some difficulty. On August 22, 1950, both fighters were simultaneously coupled to the B-29 for the first time. He comes in, hooks up, turns the autopilot on, and the thing violently pitched up, which of course rotated him over on his back, and, and uh, it, it actually tore the whole outer panel of B-29 from the engine out to the tip, broke that off, he hit the spar, sliced the nose off the F-84. I have a funny philosophy about life. I think things are going to happen to you, that they're going to happen. Have I ever worried about, about flying? No. I've never worried about it. <laughs> I just never have had that feeling. I've always felt that things would be right, and so far they have. From the earliest conception of strategic bombing, there has existed a requirement never previously fulfilled for fighter protection of bombers when over the target area. Now it appears bombers may tow two jet fighters to the target and back virtually without reducing their radius of action. This recent development of the Air Materiel Command paves the way for fighter escort protection and the solution to this heretofore unsolved problem. Here, the coupling mechanisms were installed using one B-29 and two F-84 fighters for the initial tests. Lances, one mounted on the right wing tip of the F-84 and one on the left wing tip of another, were designed to fit into retractable sockets mounted on each wing tip of a B-29 bomber. The lance enters the socket on the wing tip of the B-29 and automatically locks in place. While the lance head is locked relative to the B-29 socket, the F-84 can roll about the lance shaft. A mechanical connection between the lance shaft and the F-84 ailerons functions automatically to restore the fighter to normal flight position if any displacement in roll occurs. A sponge rubber bumper was provided to make a tight seal between the wing tips of the two airplanes. The normal position for engagement is with the socket extended 19 inches. Thus projected out of the major portion of the B-29's wingtip vortex, it enables the fighter pilot to effect a coupling more easily. These modifications increase the gross weight of the B-29 by 700 pounds, 
However, only local reinforcement of the wings was determined necessary. The accompanying animated diagrams illustrate the principle of the floating wingtip mechanism and how it operates in flight. After the bomber has extended its socket, the fighter approaches the bomber and inserts its lance into the socket. The socket depresses a small button on the leading edge of the fighter wing. The button actuates a switch which causes the tip of the lance to rotate 90 degrees inside the socket. This locks the fighter to the bomber in tow. Since the lance is oval in cross-section, it cannot rotate within the socket. The socket is then retracted, drawing the fighter wing tightly against the bomber wing. The rubber bumper along the bomber wingtip seals the air gap between the two wings. On July 21, 1950, the first B-29 bomber to be equipped with the new floating wingtip mechanisms took off the runway for a coupling test with an F-84 fighter. On this date, Major C.E. Anderson of Air Materiel Command's Flight Test Division made the first successful coupling to the wingtip of the B-29. Four successful couplings were made this day. The average time to couple varied from two to 10 minutes, and the total couple time was 30 minutes. On July 30th, 1950, Captain J.M. Davis, also of the Flight Test Division, successfully coupled to the left wing of the B-29. During this flight, Captain Davis experienced a partial loss of aileron boost, but still was able to effect two couplings with some difficulty. Several more couplings were successfully accomplished by both the left and right fighters individually in order to gain more pilot experience. On August 22, 1950, both fighters were simultaneously coupled to the B-29 for the first time. Data from these tests indicate that two F-84 aircraft could be towed by a B-29 carrying 10,000 pounds bomb load with a reduction in range of only 2.9%. Several changes are now being made which will result in an operational combination. The original installation was designed to obtain data over relatively short flights. Therefore, no provisions were made to change the relative angle of pitch between the three airplanes. It was discovered during the flight test program that the mechanical system of controlling the position of the fighters in roll is marginal. Here they will uncouple from the bomber. They will be free to escort the bomber into the target area and out again. They may do individual reconnaissance missions. Once out of the target area, they will recouple to the bomber for the tow home. It should be borne in mind that this installation was designed for test purposes to provide engineering data and not considered at this time to be a prototype installation. The Germans had, during the war, had done a considerable amount of work on wingtip towing. What they were doing was, their theory was that you could add anything out on a wingtip of an airplane and the increased in aspect ratio of the wing gave you sufficient lift to more than counterbalance the increased drag. So in effect, you got free, free fuel tanks, which is one of the things they used it for. Somewhere along the line, it was one of the Germans that came over, uh, Ben Homan was his name. Uh, it was one of the paperclip crowd that came over after the war. And he was convinced that what you really ought to do was tow a couple of fighters on the wingtip uh, of a, looking at the B-36. Since we couldn't come up with a fighter with sufficient range as an escort fighter, the idea was that the bomber would carry his own escort and when he came under attack, he'd, they'd release and go fly. And the idea was to carry three of them, one on each wingtip and one in the fuselage. The one in the fuselage, the pilot could get out and relax and do whatever he needed to do and eat. And then they'd take turns rotating around. 
It was pretty, pretty far out idea, but that was the idea. And they went on to a program, I believe it was called Tom Tom, in which they put two F-84s on the wingtip of the B-29. The effort to keep the airplane out there flying was, uh, the workload was tremendous. So what they had to do was get an autopilot that would keep the airplane stable. Uh, Bud Anderson and Johnny Davis were flying the 284s on a B-29. They were flying out of the Republic plant on Long Island. And it was to be the first test of the autopilot. Bud Anderson hooked up, could not get his autopilot to engage, so he disengaged from the from the B-29. John Davis hooked up on the other wing, engaged his autopilot. Immediately, it was a hard over, nose up, which pitched the airplane, rolled its instrument. Enough elevator, hooked up like that, closed the airplane, rolled. Rolled over, came down on the wing tip of the B-29, knocked half the wing tip of the B-29 off. That airplane went in with its full crew. John Davis flew around for a while, but uh, couldn't get out, and he was killed on landing.